Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Silpa Keshvala, Executive Vice Chancellor and CEO of Lone Star College Online. And on behalf of our entire team here at Lone Star College Online, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2024 Lone Star College Online Teaching and Learning Summit. We are just so thrilled to host this inaugural and international event that brings together a diverse group of passionate educators and experts from around the world, um, which we're just super excited about. Uh, I wanted to provide just a little bit of context. Lone Star College Online is the newest and the eighth campus in the Lone Star College system. We actually launched in fall of 2022 to provide students with the option of earning a college credential entirely online which of course aligns with our college's mission of ensuring access and opportunity for anyone seeking higher education. And so over the next two days, we are super excited to have almost 500 attendees participating in the summit who will share their experiences, their insights, best practices in online education across three learning tracks, pedagogy and best practices, instructional technologies, and student services and support. The discussions will cover a wide range of topics from curriculum design and assessment strategies to student support services and community building in the online environment. We're also going to explore cutting edge tools and technologies that enhance the online learning experience for our students. So at, at here at Lone Star College Online, our team believes that this summit uh, will serve as an invaluable platform for knowledge sharing, for collaboration, and for innovation, because we believe that by coming together in this sort of way and from learning from one another, we can collectively ensure that we remain at the forefront of online education and are continuously adapting and improving to meet the evolving needs of our online students. So we are so grateful you're here with us today and that you're participating in this, this, this summit. I did wanna um, take a moment to provide a very special thank you to Dr. Robert Green, uh, Alex Sushan, Eddie Brega, and Grimelda Stanley for their leadership and for all of their efforts and to the entire team for putting this summit on um, for everyone. At this time, it's my great honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Kasande Musoma. Dr. Musoma gained global uh, recognition and the moniker, the Professor of Kindness, after a viral video captured him holding his student's 10-month-old son during a lecture. The simple act of compassion resonated with people from around the world and sparked a conversation about the importance of kindness and humanity um, in education and in beyond and beyond throughout the world. Dr. Musoma's commitment to these values is deeply rooted in his upbringing. Born and raised in Zambia, he was privileged to grow up in a family and community where kindness and humanity were integral parts of his culture. And when he relocated to the United States, Dr. Musoma brought these values with him and they continue to guide him in his personal and his professional life. Dr. Mm -hmm. Musoma holds a bachelor's and a master's degree in agricultural development and economics from Texas A&M University and a doctorate degree in educational leadership and administration from Texas Christian University. Beyond his academic achievements, he is a dedicated father a sought after speaker, a valued board member, and an avid traveler. Please join me in extending a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Kasande Musoma. Wow, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Keshvala. Thank you so much to the team at Lone Star. Um, wherever you are, whether you're in Japan, whether you're in South Africa, whether you're in in the United States, Mexico, Japan. I, I noticed uh, that those uh, people from everywhere. Uh, please give me this next few moments. I ask you to give me a kind ear. I ask you to give me a receptive heart. 
and I ask you to give me an attentive mind, a kind ear, a receptive heart, an attentive mind. And to you, I say, Mwashiwukeni. And Mwashiwukeni in my native language means good morning. I am speaking to you from Fort Worth, Texas, and I'm so excited today to come to you this morning. You know, I am one of those people who enjoys being in the room with people and seeing your faces, but I can't. So I'm going to work with this. And so guess what? I've got a question for you. Wherever you are, please take a deep breath. Relax. And I want you to think about three things. Reflection, advocacy, and inquiry. Reflection, advocacy, and inquiry. Reflection, advocacy, and inquiry. Let me read you a poem before I start. The paradox of our time in history is that we have taller buildings, but shorter tempers, wider freeways, but narrower viewpoints. We spend more, but have less. We buy more, but enjoy less. We have bigger houses and smaller families, more conveniences, but less time. We have more degrees, but less sense. More knowledge, but less judgment. More experts, yet more problems. More medicine, but less wellness. We drink too much, smoke too much, spend too recklessly, and laugh too little. Laugh too little. I'm going to put a hashtag in there. Hashtag, let's smile. Let's smile. Everybody, wherever you are, I know everybody's going through something because we're, by our very nature of being human, we're going through something. But this author says we laugh too little. We drive too fast. We get too angry too quickly. We stay up too late and we get up too tired. We read too little and watch too much TV. And we pray seldom. seldom. We have multiplied our possessions but reduced our values. We talk too much and we love too seldom and we hate too often. We've learned to make a living, but not a life. We've added years to life, not life to years. We've been all the way to the moon and back, but have trouble crossing the street to meet a new neighbor. We've done larger things, but maybe not necessarily better things. We've cleaned up the air, but polluted the soul. We've conquered the atom, but are not our prejudice. We write more, but learn less. We plan more, but accomplish less. We've learned to rush, but not to wait. We build more computers to hold more information, to produce more copies than ever, but we communicate less and less. The author of this piece calls this the paradox of our time in history. The paradox of our time in history. Ladies and gentlemen, remember the three words I ask you to remember. Reflection, advocacy, and inquiry. So the title of my presentation today is, What's Love Got to Do With It? What's Love Got to Do With It? Please, in the, in the chat section, please flood the chat section with hearts, please. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to carry on until I see hearts coming up. Please flood the chat section with hearts. I just want to see hearts, 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 hearts. What's love got to do with it? You know, I, we're, I hear, I hear uh, Tina Turner saying, who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? I hear uh, Tina Turner say that. I hear Whitney Houston saying, learning to love yourself. It is the greatest love of all. And ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to a place of pause. What's love got to do with it? All of you are from different aspects of education. There's, there's instructors here, there's administrators, there's all kinds of stakeholders in the education space. And you've come here to understand, hopefully, to better develop programs that reach at the core of those that we educate, those that we are, we are, greatly blessed to educate. And so I want to take you to Lone Star, and I love what Lone Star's vision is. And let me read it. It says, Lone Star College will be a model college globally recognized for achieving exceptional levels of success in student learning, student completion, gainful employment, parity, and affordability. Number two, our mission. Lone Star College provides comprehensive 
educational opportunities and programs to enrich lives. Pay attention to the word enrich, to make life better. Then the philosophy. Lone Star College delivers excellent and uniform customer service, providing consistent information and uniformly helping every student, regardless of physical location, modality, college, campus, center, or medium. And ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to the eighth campus of Lone Star College, as our president, as CEO has said. So what's love got to do with it? Hmm. What's love got to do with it? I think the English language is inadequate in defining love. I mean, we hear all kinds of songs about love. And, you know, I can love uh, my ice cream. I can love my shoes. But then I want to take us to another language that gives us three types of love, eros, philia, and agape. Eros is the feeling that I have when I just met that sweetheart and I'm so excited. I can't wait. I want to capture every teardrop that you cry because I love you so much. And interestingly, all of us know that that is a state of high. Some people call it infatuation and that we, we kind of go through that and land at a place of filial love, which the, has been explained as friendship. So we move to this Eros' sexual intensity to this place of friendship where just holding a hand is enough, where just watching a Netflix show in silence is enough. Then ultimately, there's what is called agape love. Agape love is charitable love. Love is not just about admiration or virtue. It is about sympathy and generosity towards what is weak and what is imperfect. And so today, I come to you to make this proposal. When Tina Turner says, what's love got to do with it? I say everything, even in the space of education. Even in the space of education. And to you, all I say to teach is to love and to love is to teach. To teach is to love, and to love is to teach. Interestingly, in the educational arena, I'd like to propose to you that there's two types of educators. There's professors and teachers. Professors profess from a place of arrogance, from a place of disconnection, and teachers teach from a place of love and connection. Having said that, I would love to share a little bit about where I'm coming from and something that happened in my life, as Dr. Keshvala said earlier on, that literally transformed my life. Please take a moment to watch this video. And if you have questions, please keep them coming. I'd love to have a dialogue with you this morning. So let's watch this video and then we shall proceed. Thank you so much. Our series of More Perfect Union aims to show that what unites us as Americans is far stronger than what divides us. This morning, we'll introduce you to a professor at Texas A&M University. He teaches his students not just through lectures, but also through actions. Omar Villafranc is at the university in College Station, Texas, with how kindness can be a very powerful tool in the classroom. Omar, good morning. Good morning. Henry Musoma is a business professor here at Texas A&M. And if you look up above me, you can see that's him hanging right there on the, on the leadership banner. Now, every semester he has hundreds of students, but he makes it a point to try to learn their names so he can make some sort of personal connection. And now those students are showing the teacher what they've learned. Guess what happened? It's it hard for with. students to fall asleep in Dr. Henry Musoma's okay. class. Everybody stand up. He's always doing something extra. Extra engaged, extra supportive to the people he cares about most, his students. I'm reminded of a friend of mine who said he's not an educator, he's an edutainer. But it's not just in his teaching that Dr. Musoma has shown he's more than willing to do something extra. When Ashton Robinson told Dr. Musoma she couldn't come to class because she didn't have a babysitter, the answer was simple. Bring him to class. A little fussiness didn't keep the professor from finishing his lesson. 
For Jake Ross, Dr. Musoma meant so much to him that Jake's fiance surprised him by having Dr. Musoma officiate their wedding. He even helped Elizabeth Pope find a job. He knew that I loved business and medicine, and he immediately was like, you know, I've got the perfect job for you. But how does someone learn to be kind? For Musoma, his education started more than 8,000 miles away, over four decades ago in the African country of Zambia. Both my parents worked hard. My father was one of the first people in his family to go to college. Like his father, Musoma wanted an education, but an American one seemed out of reach. No, sir, too far, too expensive. But then he met Albert Cates, a U.S. State Department official who changed his mind. How did he convince you? He said, here's my business card. Come to my office tomorrow. And guess what, Omar? That night, America, <laughs> America, God shed his grace on me. I did not sleep. I was so excited. He gave me an idea. What was it? The possibility. Cates helped Musoma immigrate to America in the mid-90s. After finishing community college, he earned a scholarship at Texas A&M, graduated, and started teaching. In his classes, he often brings up the story of Cates and possibility. A lesson Musoma's former student, Sam White, remembers well. He talked about his journey to America, and at the end of every story, he would mention you know, how that this man took him in, invited him to dinner, and convinced him to go to Texas to study. So when it came time to pay back Dr. Musoma like for all his Starbucks. kindness, Sam knew what to do. I mean, a Starbucks card didn't feel right to me, right? So I was thinking, what could I do for him that would be awesome? He scoured social media sites and government records. For two years, he searched and nearly gave up. Finally, a breakthrough with the help of Ancestry.com. He received an email from Cates and helped Musoma reconnect with the past. I ran to... Uh, uh, the business school that morning with this email I printed out, and I was trying to play it cool, but of course I'm freaking out. You're like, wreck at this point. Yeah, it's like, read this right now. It's like throwing it at him. What was his reaction? It was complete silence. So I wasn't totally prepared for that because he's one of the most talkative people I've ever met, and he's always got something to say. So I handed him the email, and uh, he read through it, and then he put it in his pocket and said, thank you. He gave me a hug. Decades after their first meeting, Dr. Musoma and Albert Cates were reunited a life of kindness that has come full circle. When my son, Joshua, who's about to be seven, sees me in front of my students, and then when they leave, he looks at me and he wants to put on a little tie when I walk with them, and he says, Daddy, I love that you're kind. And if when I'm gone, if that's what my son says of me, I'll rest in peace. Now, one of the life lessons that Professor Musoma learned from his father was taking care of his extended family. And he now considers all the students here at Texas A&M part of his extended family. And that family is getting bigger every year. Nora? Well, now he has a bigger family of our audience that all love him. Omar, what a fantastic story. And kindness costs nothing. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Musoma. That's a beautiful it's piece, contagious. Omar. It is contagious. Beautifully done. Here's an easy thing you can do to add to your routine so that you age better, or maybe better yet, don't even age very much. I'm Dave Asprey. I'm the guy who created the biohacking movement. Good morning again. Sorry for that uh, little, little error. I wanna ask you, if you would please, Populate the chat room with the first word that comes to your mind after watching that segment. The first word that comes to your mind, joy, inspiring. Please keep them coming. Emotional, intelligence, kindness, grace, beautiful, amazing, kindness. Thank you. Generous, empathy, goals, hope, supportive, heartfelt, humanness, connection, admiration, heartwarming, transformational, be kind. God, ladies and powerful, ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce you to the richest man I've known in my life, my father. My father wrote this book. It's called The Village Boy Who Dared to Dream. I lost my father about a year ago. My dad grew up in a hut in Africa, in the northern part of Zambia, which is my homeland, and ended up attending Harvard University. 
And to you, ladies and gentlemen, I say you can count the number of seeds in an orange, but you can never, ever, 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 ever count the number of oranges in the seed. I'll say that again. You can count the number of seeds in an orange, but you can never, ever, ever, ever count the number of oranges in a seed. We as educators are farmers. And those of you that went to Texas A&M, remember, we used to say, farmers fight, farmers, farmers fight at the football game. And I want to say to us as educators, we have to fight in this space of pedagogy. We have to construct ideas, uh, spaces that are psychologically safe, whether it's online or one-on-one, -on -one, that allow for our students to arrive as whole people. And on that day in my classroom, I'll tell you a quick story. I had a young lady that was a single mom who asked me if, um, who actually just emailed me and said she wasn't coming to class. And this was a management course with about 300 plus students. And my response to her in the moment, I didn't think about the rules of the university. I just said, bring that baby to class. And in that moment, a seed was planted that catapulted my life and that of the young lady. She was given $10,000 towards her education. And then all of a sudden, people are inviting me to Singapore, Australia, to speak on the subject of kindness as currency in the educational space. And so today, as you go through all these uh, new technologies that will be presented to you today and tomorrow, I want to challenge you to let love be the bedrock of your understanding. Let love be that bedrock of how you execute when you return to your respective places of instruction or teaching. So when I talked about reflection, advocacy, and inquiry, I want to throw out uh, some work to you. And the, 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 the work is called The Ladder of Inference. It comes out of the book called The Fifth Discipline by Peter Sange. And Peter Sange says that we live in a world where it's very difficult to be effective. You know why? Because everybody believes that their truth is a truth. And they also, everybody believes that the truth is obvious. Everybody believes that their beliefs are based on true data. And as educators, you know how everybody says their data they interviewed 1,000 people, and so they understand how Africans think. They interviewed 10,000 people, and they know how the whole world should be. And so uh, everybody believes that their beliefs are based on true data. And then the last one is that the data we selected is the real data. And so then now we have a challenge, and the challenge is to truly come to this place of truly understanding. So when I ask the question, what is love, everybody understands love differently. But I'm so glad that we were helped by the Greek, I believe, when they gave us these three types of love, which is more descriptive. There's an inadequacy in the English language when we describe love. It says, you know what, you could go through that intense, almost uh, uh, very intense. In fact, it says that it's, it's a romantic ecstasy and it's beautiful in theory and hugely punitive in practice. It is beautiful in theory and hugely punitive in practice. Because guess what? If you don't get me at the level that I'm used to, I'm so want you to love me like this. And then we forget that our very nature as humans, we kind of go through ebbs and flows. And so the kind of love then drops down to friendship and then to agape. Agape, which says, I see your weaknesses, but I will work with you anyway. And I think our students are calling for that. I'm so proud to learn that at Lone Star Community College, uh, I mean, system, they have actually worked in a very critical mass of young people, the African-American male, and that they're seeing a lot of success with that population. Please uh, inquire about that later. Um, the success that has been experienced at Lone Star with this population of individuals is amazing. So... Any questions? Any questions so far? Alex, do we have any questions coming in? Please engage me with questions. Uh, I don't want to just talk at you. I want to talk with you. I want us to have a dialogue. Alex, do you have any questions? Yes. No, I do not have any questions in the Q&A. Hi, yet. Alex. I mean, maybe maybe someone on the team should ask me a question. Um, <laughs> thank you, Grimalda. Please post your questions. So let's kind of, before we, uh, Alex, thank you so much for coming in. Awesome. Alex, could you stay with me? I feel a bit lonely in here. Sure, yes, well, I'll stay you. on with you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so um, we do have a question in the chat. Uh, can you be adopted or uh, somebody wants Margaret G wants to know, can um, you adopt her? Margaret, 
Let's get the papers going. We, we'll work on that. <laughs> Thank you for your kindness. And in fact, uh, Alex, you know, I didn't plan on sharing this piece, but I want to introduce to you what I call the Triple H factor. And the Triple H factor is, is the number one H is humanity. Number The second H is humor. The third H is humility. Humanity, humor, and humility. Uh, in Africa, we say Ubuntu, which means I am because you are and you are because I am. In other words, the humanity in me sees the humanity in you just as much as I hope the humanity in you sees and acknowledges the humanity in me. So to, to Margaret, I say, thank you for bringing the second age, which is humor. You know, it is important that we bring back into this space. Absolutely. All right. Now you've inspired some questions here, Dr. Sure. Musoma. So I'll start with the first one in our Q and A. Um, so how do kindness and love show up in your teaching on an everyday basis? Does it show up in online teaching? Exactly. So thank you so much, Alex, for that question. So I teach in Mexico. I teach at a private university in Mexico called Tecnológico de Monterrey. Once a week, I'm live one-on-one -on, -one on a campus in Mexico. Then the other week, I'm online. And so one of the, the ways I've, I've started to engage my students consistently the first thing i do before we teach the material is we have a gratitude minute even online and in that gratitude minute i'm able to hear what the students are thankful for and to engage them a little bit further and that's why i talked about reflection advocacy and inquiry so you know creating a space and a psychologically safe space where people can feel free to ask those questions so on a daily basis let me give you an example um uh, one of the things, even the most important part, I think, for teaching class is how you introduce yourself. You know, when I introduce myself in my courses, I don't start off by giving this platitudes of what I've done and all the education I have. I just say, my name is Dr. Mishoma. That's it. And then at the end of the semester, I break it down for them if they need it to be so, because I want to respect the students in making them not feel like my story is the story. I don't want my story to be the corner piece of my classroom space. And that allows for students then to arrive more confidently, you know, in my language, the word for humility is to make yourself small so that others could be, find place. And so I use that philosophy, you know, I reduce myself. I think some of us arrive at the at teaching space too large. I went to Harvard, I went to Stanford and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, tone it down a little bit so that the students could see themselves and see possibility. Um, is right. any other? We have more questions. Perfect. Please go ahead. Okay. Um. So I'll start with the next one I saw. What is one habit you do every day to maintain joy in such a chaotic world? One habit I do every day, I meditate. I meditate every morning at about 5 a.m. And uh, I meditate using a, an app that sends me a scripture from scripture. And I reflect on that scripture uh, on a daily basis. Yes. All right, I'll take another one from the chat and we'll go back to the Q&A. Um, in the online space, what have you found to be the most effective way to connect at the heart level with students? That's a very good question. Um, in the online space, the most effective way that I found is to really, really use inquiry. You know, before I rush to the material, I really just try to humanize this, the teaching space. How are you doing? Where are you? You know, um, does anybody have something they'd like to share? At least invest a few moments of time in that space of connection. And Alex, I'd like to say to the person who asked that question, you cannot correct where you don't connect. You know, so if you're not connecting, forget correcting, you know, and so, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we have another one for you, kind of related to that. Uh, how do you work with a and to create a culture of trust with students? The student who emailed you trusted you, and how do you hold space for reluctant students? Vulnerability. Vulnerability. The students have to see us as human. You know, stop. There's no, I like to tell people today that the world is tired of uh, um superheroes we just need everyday human beings doing heroic things and sometimes when you're viewed as a superhero students will not build that trust so i i'm i am vulnerable you know like the year my father was dying of cancer i did not leave my cancer at home my father's cancer at home 
I would say to the students, sometimes I just say, guys, you're not getting the best of me today because my dad's situation just killing me. And you know what? Then we we became a village. And in Africa, we say that it takes a village to, to raise a child. And so make your space a village as best as you know how, you know? And so, yes. All right. Thank you for that response. We have another question kind of related to that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, all right. How do you work around strict college policies that make loving students difficult, like a policy that prevents children in classrooms? Um, <laughs> Dr. Keshwala, please don't listen in on what I'm about to say. Uh, I, Lone Star does not endorse this message, but this is my simple and very clear message to everybody listening. You can bend the rules, but don't break them. Uh, be creative. It calls for creativity. You know, um, I'm not saying every bring a baby to class, you know, I, I just happen to have a moment where that happened, but I'm saying within the, the rules that you have, be as creative as you can. Let me give you an example. One of the things I did when I was teaching at Texas A&M is I did breakfast with my students at 6 a.m. Whoever could come, it wasn't required. They, and guess what? In one of the classes that I was teaching, I had made a statement that seemed political. And one of the young men that did not like that statement came to my breakfast. And then he asked me. And then when we went back to class, I was able to publicly say, guys, what I said was misunderstood. And I do apologize. You know, and so you get you create multiple. You know how people say when you want to raise money, you have to have multiple streams of revenue. I think if you want to be an effective educator, you have to have multiple streams of accessing and understanding those that you teach. So I'll give you one great thing that I love to do, Alex. The first day of class, I make my students do what I call a relational currency exercise. And they write on a piece of paper the size of a dollar. They introduce themselves to me. And then I'm able to keep those little pieces of paper and then know little bits about them so that when I'm teaching, I can bring up their stories. So then they start to become part. It's about inclusivity you know, and, you know, not exclusivity. I think education for too long has been an exclusive place, but it's inclusivity. Okay. Well, thank you for that response. We still have more questions that are in the chat and the Q&A. So I'll start with the next one I see. Uh, how do you keep your spirit strong and recharge so that you can give your students and extend your family your best self? Well, <laughs> You know what, um, to the person who asked that question, I'm gonna say, I'm not my best self every day and I'm okay with that. I think we have to resign or retire from perfection. And I think when I say humanizing the space, you know, I think our students are more forgiving when we're human, when we don't fully show up. I think I talked about the three types of love, eros, philia, and agape. To, to expect perfection is like, Eros, like living in Eros. And uh, it's like, it's beautiful in theory and hugely punitive in practice. I like to dance between philia and agape, where I allow my students to fully see me as human. And when on the days that I'm not at my best, they're forgiving. And then on the days that we're really doing well, then they also celebrate. I think we need to model life as it is, not this um, artificial way of existence. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, we have some more questions still coming in. All right, the next one. Um, what are some online teaching practices that you have seen that are not teaching from a place of love? Also, how do you deal with the issues of academic dishonesty from a place of love? Perfect. Um, death by PowerPoint is the worst thing on online education. <laughs> um, we, are, we are killing our students with PowerPoints, you know. Um, we're killing our students with being so married to a design of an instruction that is not fluid and organic that responds to where they're at. You know, one of the things I've enjoyed about teaching in Mexico, I'm teaching at a university that is extremely disruptive. I was in Barcelona two years ago at a United Nations conference representing my university. And you know what we've done, Alex, is we've come up with a curriculum that is only four week semesters. And then our students are required to have applications based educations. In other words, instead of Harvard doing case based learning, we are doing applications based learning. And each and every one of our students is engaged with somebody either in industry 
or in some kind of organization, depending on their interest. And so the the uh, the goal of that curriculum is to make sure that what our students are learning helps them in their lives. And so for us, most of us, that's not the case across the world. And so we have to be creative. It takes time. It takes planning. Let me give an example. Maybe maybe that would help. Um, yes, when I'm when we're talking about. Uh, the disparity in pay, the gender gap in pay, women versus men. I asked my students if they were male to write a letter of apology to their moms. And the letter of apology was to say, mom, I'm sorry, I didn't understand that as a male, I actually have an advantage that I didn't choose. That, you know, when my baby's born, most society does not expect me to be at home with the baby, whereas our society, for the most part, has expected the, the 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 woman to stay with a baby and then I then we have these conversations that allow them to really bring it home and then I say you know what your mom probably made a decision at the point that she put you in school whether to work or whether to stay at home if she stayed at home she felt like she lost if she went to work she felt like she lost and that was difficult so we you know make things practical make things applicable I have a model Alex that I use I call it the ADA model and so I'm always asking my students, what have you been made aware of today that you're not aware of? The D is, well, how do you plan to develop this thing that you've been made aware of? And then third, how do you plan to apply it in your life? So, yeah. Other questions? Sorry, I'm I'm going long. No, you're good. We still have plenty of time for questions. All right. Let me see if I'm catching up here. Um, let's, all right. These are kind of similar. Uh, so what advice do you have to encourage tenured faculty to learn the lesson um, of professor versus teacher? <laughs> oh my goodness. I wish I could have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Alex, should I be just super honest on this one or should I? <laughs> you have okay. the floor. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and I'm the keynote, right? So, um, yes. Um, I understand the demands of research. I'm not naive to that. And, uh, you know, they say what, publish or perish for a tenure faculty. And I also understand the significance of teaching. Um, tenure professors, if you happen to have assistance or a support staff, use your support staff to, um, to be your agents of that level of connection and then let them feed you with that information that allows for you to at least be responsive. Cause I know you have such a responsibility with research and research is significant to our universities. No one is blind to that. It brings us a lot of revenue and we can bite the hand that feeds us. So to you, we say, thank you for your research. It, it, it feeds us with information and new knowledge. Uh, use your support staff to stay connected with those that you teach. And then every now and then create spaces. You know, one of the things that you could do is maybe, I know you're busy, but maybe once a month host something that is called, I host this with my students. I call it coffee house conversations. And we do this online. Everybody shows up on Zoom with a mug, a coffee mug, and we discuss issues or um, just have conversations. And um, in my language, they say, umweo wa muntu. Alex, I'm going to ask you to say this. Umweo. 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 Well, Wamuntu. Wamuntu. Wawa. Wawa. <laughs> Mukutui. <laughs> All right. Say that Mukutui. again. Umweo. Umweo. Wamuntu. Wamuntu. Wawa. Wawa. Mukutui. Mukutui. Yes. And what that means is, Alex, your life is in your ear. That's what it means in my language. They're saying, you know what? If you want to have life, create life, you have to listen. And so uh, if, you're not, if we're not listening to those that we're teaching, we're professing. Teaching is a conversation while professing is just talking at. And so if you don't have the time or the luxury to really listen, create things around you that allow for you to hear what you're not able to hear because of circumstances. Was there another question? I think I, I missed a second part to that. Did I? No, I think you answered that one. Okay. Like we've, we've got a few questions yet. Okay, we still have more time for questions. Um, so the next one, how do you react to people who are not kind to you? How do you build relationships with them? Huh. I'm going to go to my Facebook real quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I posted something on Facebook yesterday regarding that question, and I, I want to read it word for word. Is that okay? That's uh, perfectly fine. And while we're doing this, remember the three words for the day, reflection, 
advocacy and inquiry. I'm going to close with that. Alex, please remind me. I'm going to close with those three things. And I'm going to go to my Facebook page. And it's really cool because I just wrote about this yesterday and I thought it was beautiful. Sorry, I'm not supposed to go to my Facebook while I'm talking to you, but I will today because uh, you just asked a question that makes me want to just answer you from there. Um, so I said yesterday, I am learning. I am learning to let people believe what they believe. I am also learning more and more that no one has a monopoly on truth. And with that, I'm also learning that I don't have to be liked by everybody. And so when people are not kind to me, yes, I will practice love in the sense that I say I will try to love through weakness. I will try, try to love through imperfection. But I've also understand that I'm only human. And I have limitations. I can't fix everything that's wrong around me. I can't write everything that should be right around me. So I am learning in my life to win where it matters, W. And if I can't win with you, I don't call it a loss. I call it a lesson. If I can't win with you, I don't call it a loss. I call it a lesson. I'll learn. I'm trying to learn even to pe from people that are not kind to me. What can I learn from it? Did I make a mistake? And if I feel like I didn't, I'm okay with moving on. So. All right. Well, thank you for those wonderful, that wonderful advice, uh, how to handle that. So related, um, the next question is, do you have any strategies to stay grounded enough to slow down and connect when life gets hectic? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I'm going to sell my book. I'm writing a book called Okukakulua. Okukakulua. In my language, it means to become free. And the book premise is living, loving, and leading from a place of freedom. I think most of us live, love, and lead from places of oppression. So instead of education being a place of liberation, education becomes a space of oppression because you can't give what you don't have. And so for me, staying grounded requires me to do a couple of things. Number one, drink water. A lot of it. You're made up of water and yet you don't drink it. You drink a lot of water. Number two, breathe. The word inspire means to breathe. Breathe. Number three, sleep well. I think a lot of us don't sleep well, especially in the education space. We stay busy and we stay up quite late because, you know, it's, a, it's the nature of our work. You're grading, you're doing a lot of different things. But if you can as much as you can, please sleep well. Then the one that I've actually learned recently for me is to eat well. And when I say eat well, I'm not just talking about slopping your food on the plate. I make my food beautiful. Like I plate my food. You know, when you go to a restaurant, they plate your food, especially fine dining. I'm learning to bring that into my own space at home. And having said that, I'm going to read you a poem. And it's called Sweet Darkness. And this was also, also wasn't part of my plan, but then I love the questions and where it's taken us to. So Sweet Darkness, it's a poem written by Dr. White out of the UK. He says, Alex, Eddie, Silpa, Larry, Grimalda, if you don't mind, please turning on your screens. I'd love to see your faces. I want us to have a community here, if that's okay, if you're able to. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This poem says, it's sweet darkness. And, and Larry and Grimelda, Eddie and Alex, I want you all to lean in as if like we're having this very close conversation. And it says, when your eyes are tired, the world is tired also. When your vision has gone, no part of the world can find you. It's time to go into the dark where the night has eyes to recognize its own. There you can be sure you're not beyond love. The dark will be your home tonight. It's okay for us to have these hard spaces. I'm not naive to think that it's all rosy and that I'm always madly in love with everything that I'm doing. 
but I propose it as an aspiration. The night will give you a horizon further than you can see. You must learn one thing. How many things, Eddie? One thing. One thing. The world was made to be free in. Give up all other worlds except the one to which you belong. Sometimes it takes darkness, Alex. Sometimes it takes darkness, Grimelda. Sometimes it takes darkness, Larry. Sometimes it takes darkness and the sweet confinement of your aloneness to learn that anything or anyone that does not bring you alive is too small for you. Anything or anyone that does not bring you alive is too small for you. That's how I say I stay driven. You know, that's how I keep pushing. That's how I keep fighting for my students. You know, I, I, I'm hoping to bring life, to bring them alive in the space, whether I'm teaching math, whether I'm teaching business, ethics, you know, how can I be creative that the classroom space is actually, in the words of Tolstoy, he says, we shall not cease from exploration, Larry. We shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place for the first time. We shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive at the place we started and to know the place for the first time. Ladies and gentlemen, I gave you the Triple H factor, humanity, humor, and humility. As lovers in the space of education, let's bring back the piece of humanity, connecting with those that we teach, finding their humanity. Let's bring a little laughter in our classroom. It doesn't have to be so boring and dead and dry. Even if it's online, you know? Can I tell you a bad joke, Larry, that I told to my students one day? And it's so funny, Larry. One time, Eddie, my son and I were sitting and uh, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to share this, but this is family, right? It's okay. Let's relax. Eddie, I, I, I'm embarrassed, but I'm going to share it anyway. Uh, we just had, uh, my kids and I just had um, fajitas and some of my favorite food. And my stomach just had gas. And so I, I, I flatulated. I'm going to say it properly. I flatulated. And then my son says, Miss Grimelda, my son says, oh, daddy, that's disgusting. And I looked at my son with a serious face. Larry, you know, your kids, when you give them that serious face, I went like this. I said, Joshua, don't you ever, ever, ever talk to me like that. I am your farter. And my son just lost it. And in that moment, he saw his dad as just a guy, just a human being. And I think we need to bring humanity back in the space of learning. You know, we shall not cease from exploration. This journey has taken us so many places. Education confuses. It, it, it sometimes is, it, it just makes you feel like things are wrong, but then all of us just want to come to a place that feels like home. All of us, no matter PhD, masters, everybody wants to come home. And guess what? What? That's the place of wealth. Oh. Okay, Some so we, go ahead. Go ahead. Was, we've got about four minutes left. Oh, questions. Yes. Um, four minutes left. So I was gonna say we got maybe about one more question, but then we're gonna need about 30 seconds to wrap this up. Perfect. All right. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think of what's gonna be our last question here. So uh, one of ours, is, I guess we'll do this one. What guidance can you provide for, for college faculty and staff that have to simultaneously be nucleus for students, faculty, and administration? That they have to be what? Sorry, sorry, I missed the word in there. They have to be the nucleus for students, faculty, and administration. That is a big word. I don't, Eddie, could you help me with that? I don't understand <laughs> nucleus. <laughs> um, I guess their center, their world. And who tells you you have to be the center of anybody's world? <laughs> I don't know. That was the question in our Q and A. So wherever you are, please, you're gonna you're gonna go crazy. <laughs> be, be the center of your own world, and hopefully, the other world is centered enough. You know, it, you know, we talk about work life balance. There's a problem there. You know what I mean? If you're being the center of everybody's world, you're not in the right place. You're gonna crack. And trust me, 
mental health is real. I, I was in a mental hospital myself in high school. That's another conversation. It is real. If you try to be the center of everybody's world, you will crack. Yes, that's true. All right. Um, let's see. Let's say, do we have time for one more question? Um, yeah, let's say, I got one. Or so. Two minutes. <laughs> yeah, we got two minutes. So I'll do one more question that came in. Uh, I don't think we asked this one. How do you maintain a respectful and positive attitude uh, to and for students, even in situations where you may not be receiving equal respect and positivity? Wow, 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 wow. Keep pushing, keep pushing, ask questions. I'm gonna leave you with three things. Number one, you have to become more aware of your own thinking and reasoning, that's reflection. Become more aware of your own thinking and reasoning, you actually might be the problem. Number two, make your thinking and reasoning more visible to others. Sometimes we think students know, but they don't. And number three, we have to practice inquiry, inquiry into others' thinking. You know, so I, I said th three words, reflection, advocacy, inquiry. Become more aware of your own thinking and reasoning. In other words, reflect, reflect, reflect. Then number two, advocacy. Make your thinking and reasoning more visible to others and ultimately inquiry, ask questions. Curiosity did not kill the cat. Curiosity won the Nobel Peace Prize. Thank you all so, so very much. <laughs> all right, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mitsumo, for being here today. We've got about one minute, so we're gonna go ahead and wrap this up. So I'm going to tell everyone, I'm um, sorry, but we're out of time for this session. But thank you again for being here, Dr. Musama. We really appreciate it. You had some very wonderful words of wisdom for all of us to walk away with today. Um, I'm going to put a shout out to the attendees. We do have a uh, session survey for this, for all of our sessions. So um, please take a moment to fill out the quick session survey. You can access it by clicking on the rate session button in Whova, if you can access that. And we really do appreciate you all for attending this session today, and we will see you in another session. But once again, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Musoma, for being here. We really appreciate having you here with us today. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks to the team. I wish you well.